hello everyone. This is Alfadi, and uh, we welcome you back to this uh, series that we are going through right now, myself and Dr. J. Smith, concerning the scientific miracles of the Quran. Our job, of course, is to present some of these top maybe 10 or 12 miracles uh, or supposed claim of miracles that are used by our Muslim friends and our refutation of that. The first one we're going to start with today has to do with the fact that somehow the Quran presents the mountains as if God, the Allah of Islam, have created him to stabilize the earth. And with that, I'm going to turn to my dear brother, Dr. J. Smith, to address this miracle. Okay, and we're going to do one video per scientific Absolutely, supposed Absolutely, because Let's we do want that. it to be so easier for people. It's to be shorter, but then people can go right to that and unpack it so they understand it. So let's go ahead, and the first one we'll start with is what I call mountains are put on earth as tent pegs. Uh, if you let's go and put the slide up there, you can see the slide there. Uh, the Surah 16, verse 15, Surah 21, verse 31, Surah 31, verse 10 is the best one. It's the most ac uh, most clear one. Uh, uh, Surah 20, 78, verse 6 and 7, and Surah 88, verse 19. I've got my Quran right here, so I'm going to open up to Surah 31, verse 10, and read what it exactly says in the English, not in the That's Arabic. Right. You have the Arabic there. You can read it there. And it says here, he has created the heavens without any pillars that you see. So these are invisible pillars uh, uh, in the heavens. And has set on the earth firm mountains, lest it should shake with you. So set mountains on the earth to keep it from shaking. That's what it says there. That's right. Let's go back to the slide again. Dr. Muhammad Mutalib out of Al-Azhar University unpacks this. And he says, Allah placed mountains for the purpose of putting down roots into the earth, much like the pegs of a tent, which hold the tent from blowing away. Without mountains, he says, the earth's rotation would cause everything to simply fly apart, leaving chaos. So, no mountains, no earth. So that's how he was unpacking uh, chapter 31, verse 10. When you look at mountains on tent pegs, just let, take a look at those pictures there. I think, well, first of all, he forgot about gravity. I don't think mountains keep the earth, for all of us, from flying out into space. Mountains may look heavy if you're an unscientific man or a pre-scientific man. Uh, these great big structures that you come across in the distance, they may look heavy, and maybe you think that, oh, they keep us from going into space. Right. But we know good and well it's gravity that gave us, that keeps us on earth. Nonetheless, let's go in about the mountains as well. Take a look at those two maps there, and you can see where the greatest amount of activity or shaking goes on, where the eighth earthquakes happen, where the tsunamis happen. Look in the red there on the left picture. Right. So in the left, you have those. By the way, the tectonic plates, those are plates that are even underneath the water, and they tend to move. Okay, we're going to get into that, but let's just look at these red areas. This is where the activity... So this is where you would expect to have mountains to keep the earth from shaking, because that's where the shaking happens. On the right-hand uh, right map, that's more looking at the Pacific Rim, and those are that's well known as the most volatile area on earth. That's where I lived in Japan for two years, and right. goodness sakes, did we have enormous amount of earthquakes. And they and, had to and that's build where these volcanic activities also take place. Volcanic. Hold those yeah. two right there, right. okay? Yeah. So if you look on the world map and on the Pacific especially, you will see that there is an enormous amount of activity. So this is what the scholar is saying is why mountains were placed, to keep that activity down. Now, here's the problem. Can you see it right away? Now, neither of us are scientists, are we? No. But you've already answered two things. You've already suggested two things that may... Uh, may uh, cause the earth to shake. What are the two things you mentioned? Well, we talked about earthquakes and volcanic activities. Earthquakes especially, and they happen mostly around mountains, and they happen also around volcanoes. Right. I grew up and was born and grew up in the Himalaya Mountains, uh, which are the tallest mountains on earth. They're also the newest and the youngest mountains on earth. Now, where I grew up, uh, up at 7,000 feet. We have a house there. We own a house. Our house had been built earlier uh, by another uh, uh, another owner, and there was a earthquake that happened, as happens all the time in the Himalayas, and the entire house went down 
the hillside, there was a woman inside, and she was killed. So they had to rebuild it again. This was long. This was actually before I was born. This happened in Masuri, up in India. They had to build it again, and they had to build a pushta, which means a retaining wall to hold up the flat area from where the next house is going to be built. Now, what they, by law, you have to hold it there for 10 years. You have to keep it there without building. And the reason they do that in the Himalaya Mountains in India is that it has to go through 10 seasons of first monsoon, where there's a lot of an enormous amount of rain, and then 10 seasons of the earthquakes. So that if it can withstand 10 seasons of earthquakes, shaking, 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 and the water coming down and the landslides that all happen, then and only then, then can you build the next, the new house. And that's why our house is still standing today, because it finally went through that regimen. I am very well aware of someone who has grown up in the Himalayas, who spent my first 17 years in the Himalayas, that uh, there are earthquakes all the time happening. Now, why? Right. Well, let me tell you, if you were to leave my house there in uh, the Himalayan Mountains and go five miles out along Tiri Road, you will come to these beautiful structures along the road, which are rippling effects, and it looks like the bottom of the sea, because you can see crustaceans in the rocks there. These are fossils of sea crustaceans, but they're at 10,000 feet. What are they doing at 10,000 feet? What do you think is happening here? You actually mentioned it. You mean you're talking about the the the, uh, the fault lines? The tectonic plates. That's right. These yeah. are tectonic plates. So explain what are tectonic plates. Well, tectonic plates, basically, it's the earth, you know, as we know it, is made out of plates that are connected with each other. In fact, there is this theory that when you look at the edge of South America and uh, the Horn of Africa, uh, the claim is that, you know, they were attached and somehow they were separated because the tectonic plates always have activities. They're moving. Now, they, we don't notice it, but they're moving. Sometimes when they move faster than usual, you begin to have those earthquakes and other activities. There are uh, some videos that people can watch. If you go down in the uh, uh, bottom of the oceans, you'll see these activities taking place. You'll see volcan uh, volcanic activities and you know other things that are happening. Exactly. And when yeah. you look at the Alps, yeah. that is yeah. a tectonic plate that's crashing up against the European plate. Or going creating, underneath yeah, another one, you know. But when you have two tectonic plates that meet together... It pushes up a wrinkle in the Earth's surface. That's right. I mean, it's normal uh, for that to happen. You know? The Indian plate is an entire plate that is pushing up against the Tibetan plate. That's what's created in the Himalaya Mountains. Right. Now, they wouldn't have known that in the 7th century, but they did, or the 8th century when the Quran was written. But they do know that in the 20th century. Tectonic plates have just been discovered. This... The Himalaya Mountains are the result of two plates colliding against each other, creating the mountains. That's why we have earthquakes every year. I've grown up with earthquakes. And that's why when you look at that, when you look at tectonic plates, one crashing against the other, all of the major mountain ranges have come about. Now, let me say not all. The majority of major mountain ranges have come about through tectonic activity creating those wrinkles in the surface. In fact, the Himalaya Mountains are still growing. They're still pushing up. And it grows, oh, about the length of a one fingernail a year. Not very fast. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, here's the thing. You know, uh, uh, there is different types of rocks. You have volcanic rocks. That's obviously came out of volcanoes. Uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, ig 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 I mean, they call it igneous rocks, you know, ba basically because they have different types, you know, like the granite, for instance. And uh, you have also sedimentary rocks. And uh, the sedimentary rocks go against this theory that God created the mountains to stabilize because sedimentary rocks, how do we know them? When water comes in and they wither, you know, they begin to erode, actually. They lessen in size and you begin to see the layers. So if they were created to stabilize, then we have a problem here. How come the earth didn't move when that happened? Absolutely. Now let's get back to your tectonic plates. I want to bring up the slides again because I want, there are three forms of tectonic activity. Let's start with the first one. It's called subduction. Uh, this is the case where you have dense oceanic crust slips under the lighter continental crust. Compression thrusts up mountains and friction often produces volcanoes. And you have examples of this in the Rockies in, the, in America, the Andes in South America, and Mount St. Helens in Washington. And you remember... Right. You remember in, in, uh, that exploded in my lifetime, right. in your lifetime. You remember when that happened, 35 people lost their lives because they refused to get out of the way, thinking this would not be a problem. Absolutely. And I want to show people, here is one tectonic plate, and here's another. They're hitting each other, and when they hit, it, hit each other with the friction, there is heat, and that causes the volcano, basically. Pressure, gas, and everything. Now, a second form of tectonic activity which creates mountains is what we know as thrust, which you see there on the screen. 
Uh, this is caused by the collision of two regions of continental crust, better, as we talked earlier, tectonic plates. Simple compression thrusts the mountains up and forces down a route. Now, examples of this are what I was talking about, the Himalaya Mountains, where I grew up. That's right. This is a, a, a classic case of thrust. Uh, now, the Himalaya Mountains are growing about the pace of one fingernail there, so we're not sitting there going, ooh, look at this. We're not making a big thing about it. But also the Alps in Europe and the Urals in Russia are other examples of these wrinkles in the Earth's crust that create mountains. And then we get to what we call the slip. Uh, this is very important for people living in California, for instance. This mm -hmm. is caused by two tectonic plates sliding past or underneath each other. So they're not pushing up to create a crust. They're actually sliding. One slides under the other. Right. The best known example of this would be the San Andreas Fault, which you can see a picture of it right there right. in California. And this has always been associated with violent earthquakes. In fact, that almost happens all the time. And what they're hoping is that they keep up these violent er these earthquakes because you, if you don't have an earthquake for a long time, it just builds up, builds up, builds up. It's still moving, and then finally it's going to go, and that that's going to cause enormous amount of damage. Absolutely. And the slip basically is really it's like one go in one direction and the other go in the other direction. And scientists know this easily. I mean, it's like they map it, They're like a DNA. They study the minerals here and here, and they begin to match it, and they know that one time it was here, now it moved. Another example for those from coming from Britain is the Great Glen across Scotland, which runs right next to Britain's highest mountain, Ben Nevis. So these are three different forms of tectonic activity that are well known today. Now, if you are a pre-scientific man or somebody who is writing the Quran down, and of course we know there was a group of men who probably wrote the Quran down, and you never knew, had heard about volcanic activity, which creates people, things like Krakatoa in the Pacific, uh, Pacific Ocean, uh, or you, they would see these huge mountains, and anybody visibly looking at these mountains thinks, right. ooh, they're heavy, they're big. And that's what you will discover, brother, you know, and I'm sure you're going to touch on this. The rule of thumb, most of it is seeing evidence. Observation. Exactly. Straight observation. Yeah. Nothing more, nothing less. Your conclusion to that observation, ah, they're big, therefore they hold the earth from shaking. Right, you have to come up with a, with a reason why they're huge, you know, what does he do, you know, basically. So here is a scientific proof that proves to be a scientific error. That's right. I mean, if God, who created the mountains, knows anything about tectonic activities, would have said something about that. Yeah, you can see. Huge, huge problem. In fact, Muslims don't even bring this up anymore. Well, that was interesting, brother. Thank you so much for uh, investing this time. And I know uh, we said we we're going to make them short for people, but you can see why this is important information as well. And we want you to benefit from this. In fact, we gave you a, a crash course in geology, actually. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. J. Smith. And uh, we uh, thank all of you, of course, for joining us here. I'm your host, Al Fadi. And until we meet again, myself and Dr. J. Smith wish you all a blessed day. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. Also, hit the bell so that you don't miss future videos. And please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Sira International. And together we can introduce Muslims to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you.